physical body, we are mortal. We are born, we live, we die. With material form, there is impermanence. There is creation, existence, annihilation, and void. A higher level is the formless heaven. Here, there is no sensuality, no form of male or female, no material form. The inhabitants have no sufferings arising from external circumstances or deterioration. However, here exists the suffering of the realization that nothing is eternal. Nothing lasts forever that the beings here are not in nirvana. For example, one is not eternal or able to remain in the formless heaven forever. Therefore, the only way to be free and happy is to transcend the three realms of the desire heaven, the form heaven, and the formless heaven of pure spirit. How? By practicing according to the Buddha's teachings. For in this way, we will generate the Bodhi mind and be enlightened. The Bodhi mind is fulfilled by the four great vows of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Sentient beings are innumerable. I vow to ha help them all. Afflictions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them all. Dharma doors are innumerable. I vow to learn them all. Enlightenment is unsurpassable. I vow to attain it. Mahayana bodhisattvas cherish the heart to help all sentient beings. They not only know their own suffering and try to help themselves, but they also want to help their families, relatives, friends, all sentient beings. To equally wish to help all beings, this is the great Bodhi mind. The Infinite Life Sutra tells us that bodhisattvas are the unrequested friends of all beings. Even if you do not seek help from them, they come to help. They voluntarily introduce Buddhism to all. And this is the pure cause of a bodhisattva. To help all beings, we need to first know how to help ourselves. To do this, we first free ourselves from worries and afflictions. It is important for us to follow the four great vows in the order listed. However, some practitioners practice the third vow of the various methods before they practice the second vow to end all afflictions. 
of the four great vows. They want to achieve the latter two of learning all methods and attaining enlightenment before vowing to help all beings and ending all afflictions. Their attempts are like trying to build the third and fourth floor of a building before beginning to build the first and second floors. Today, there are many practitioners, but few of them have succeeded. Why? They do not understand that first they needed to vow to help all sentient beings. For this great compassion is a critical driving force for us to truly study and practice. This is the heart of great kindness and compassion. Nor did they begin with prerequisites of eliminating delusions, greed, attachments, and ignorance which disturb and distress the mind. There are so many beings waiting for us to help them, to help them break away from their suffering. If we have no virtue, no knowledge, no wisdom, no ability, how can we help others? We do not attain Buddhahood for ourselves. This is the power of great kindness and compassion. Years ago, when I first started to study with my late teacher, Mr. Lee, he placed three restrictions on me. First, I was to follow only his lecturing or teaching. Second, I was to read no books or reference materials without his permission. And third, as everything I had previously learned was not recognized, I was to restart as a beginner. The first blocked my ears. The second covered my eyes and the third cleared my mind. The requirements seemed so imperious and unreasonable. What an arrogant and autocratic man he is, I thought. Yet, I still accepted his restrictions and learned from him. I did not realize that these restrictions were precepts to help me cut off my afflictions. My mind became purer with less wandering thoughts after following his restrictions for just six months. His method helped me to practice the second great vow to end all afflictions. I became very grateful to him. Although he had only asked me to follow his requirements for five years, I volunteered to extend my study for another five. After ten years as his student, and abiding by his rules, I had established a solid
foundation in Buddhism. Thus, he lifted the ban and encouraged me to broaden my field of study. In other words, I could listen to any teacher, even ones with deviated thoughts. I could read any books. Why? He told me that all knowledge would be beneficial rather than harmful to me because I could distinguish between good or bad, right or wrong. I would not be misled by anyone. He likened it to a child who was innocent and young, needing to be protected by the parents before having the ability to judge and to make decisions. Good teachers are truly compassionate and kind. They are patient in teaching and are dedicated in their duty. They try to protect their students from contamination of the mind. It is crucial to us to be close to a good teacher. However, being close does not being next to the teacher, but rather it means to listen to, to follow their teachings. It is usually very hard to find one. We only meet the right teacher after many, many lifetimes. Some people have asked me how I was able to meet a good teacher since I was so fortunate to have met good ones. This teacher is to be encountered rather than sought. And the chances for this are very rare indeed. It is a matter of affinity and the right conditions maturing. We need to nurture the good root and opportunities. If we are unable to find these rare teachers, then we can learn from ancient sages. Mr. Lee modestly told me that he only had the ability to teach me for five years. He encouraged me to continue my studying by learning from his teacher, the late Master Inguang. He advised me to emulate, not to emulate people who were famous Buddhist scholars, who were knowledgeable in Buddhist studies, but who had attained no achievement in cultivation. Master Inguang was currently the best teacher. When we cannot find the true knowledge of goodness in current teachers, we can turn to ancient sages. There have been many people who have succeeded with this method. The first person in China to take an ancient master as his teacher was Mencius. He learned from Confucius, who had left his writings for later generations to learn from. Mencius only read Confucius books and followed his teachings exclusively. 
He is acknowledged as a great sage, as was Confucius. After Mencius, there were many others who succeeded in their academic pursuits using the same method. Another example is Master Oe of the Ming Dynasty, who was a patriarch of the Pure Land School. As for finding a good teacher today, do not follow me. I am not eligible to be a teacher. Mr. Lee once advised me to follow Master Ing Guang. I recommend that you select the best teacher, Buddha Amitabha and the Infinite Life Sutra for your practice. When we succeed in our practice, we will attain Buddhahood. The most important thing in Buddhism is to concentrate on and to delve deeply into one method. Then we will surely reach deep concentration and attain wisdom. In times past, people devoted to practice normally spent five years for this stage of learning and cultivation. During these five years, they would specialize in one certain method. Afterwards, they were allowed to study various sutras. At that point, I believe their understanding would be greatly improved and they would naturally understand the meanings in the sutras. If we still have wandering and discriminatory thoughts and have not yet awakened our wisdom, then even if we were to study for 300 years, we would not understand the meanings of the sutras and their commentaries. Mr. Lee had set three restrictions for me, which I thought were his alone. In 1989, when I was lecturing in Singapore, Master Yang Pei invited me to give a lecture to a group of practitioners. Seeing that there were many young people, I told them of my past experiences and advised them solely to follow Master Yang Pei. I recommended that they follow one teacher, one method. In this way, they would surely succeed. After the lecture, the master invited me to have tea with him. He told me that when he was a young monk, his master, his teacher, had set the same restrictions for him. Then I realized that the three restrictions were not the invention of one individual. Rather, they were the prerequisites that past masters had set for their students. Only then did I understand what inheritance from the master meant. When the teacher thinks that we are good students, he will require us to follow the three restrictions. He will first cover our eyes 
and block our ears so that no worries will intrude. When we truly have abandoned all attachments and gained wisdom, we will be allowed to study other materials, other methods. Therefore, extensive learning is conducted in the second stage rather than in the beginning. Difficulties can arise if we engage in extensive learning at the very beginning. It is similar to hearing instructions from one master and beginning to follow him. Then we hear instructions from a second master and feel as if we were facing two, ba two paths leading in different directions. With three masters, we would be caught at a three-way junction, and with four, we would be stuck at a crossroads, not knowing which way to go. Therefore, it is important to follow one master at one time. Reading of ancient sages monks, and lay people, we see that some followed their teacher for 20 to 30 years until they achieved some awakening. Only then did they begin to study extensively with others. Buddhist education is different from modern education in terms of concepts and methods. For instance, in a university, we must be very careful and take our time choosing our major. Buddhism, however, is different. Here, we are expected to awaken to perfect, complete wisdom first, and then in the future, we will become knowledgeable in all other departments of the university. Where do we start? From the intensive study of just one method. Just as is said in, awakening in one sutra means awakening in all sutras. What does awakening mean? Awakened means to have attained wisdom. Modern education is similar to building a pyramid. We read extensively and then narrow the scope of learning to specialize in one subject. This is a way of progressing from extensive to intensive learning. But no matter how tall the pyramid or how large its base, the pyramid has its zenith. Buddhism is different. It is like a tree with roots, trunk, branches, leaves, and finally fruits. It is an infinite process, starting from one point, the root, and then developing into the great perfection of the self, nature. The result is that we understand everything. Worldly knowledge has its 
limitations, after which there is no more to learn. Buddhism, however, is boundless. The wisdom of Buddhism is beyond the comprehension of average people. Buddhism may seem ordinary at the beginning, but the achievements we make later are inconceivable. On the contrary, worldly studies initially appear extensive and comprehensive, but in the end they provide no lasting achievement. By following the four great vows, we will eventually uncover our original self-nature. In the Flower Adornment Sutra, Sudhana served as a role model for our cultivation. He not only taught us the principles and methods, but also how to apply them in our daily lives. Manjushri Bodhisattva, Sudhana's first teacher, instructed him to follow the aforementioned three restrictions and to sever all afflictions, to accomplish self-discipline, deep concentration, and wisdom. After Sudhana had attained original wisdom, Manjushri Bodhisattva then allowed him to travel extensively and to learn other methods by visiting 53 spiritual guides who represented different occupations and levels in society. His last visit was with Universal Worthy Bodhisattva, who taught him the Ten Great Vows as well as how to chant Amitabha and to be born into the Western Pure Land, where upon meeting Buddha Amitabha, he attained perfect, complete enlightenment. Without being born into the Pure Land and meeting Amitabha, we will only fulfill the second and third vow of severing all afflictions and mastering all methods, but we will find it difficult to attain Buddhahood. In the Flower Adornment Sutra, both Manjushri Bodhisattva and Universal Worthy Bodhisattva had reached the level of equal enlightenment and vowed to be born into the Pure Land. I was surprisingly pleased to discover this when I gave talks on the Flower Adornment Sutra. I wondered why enlightened bodhisattvas in the flower adornment world would want to be born into the Western Pure Land, considering how wonderful their own world was. It seemed unnecessary for them to do so. After thinking about it, I realized that they had vowed to go there to be able to attain Buddhahood in a short time. If not for this, there would be no reason to go to the Pure Land of Buddha Amitabha. Suddenly I realized 
that if we want to attain the perfect, complete enlightenment, we need to go to the Western Pure Land. Only by understanding the chapter of Universal Worthy Bodhisattva's conduct and vows will we know the proper way to study and practice Mahayana Buddhism. And when we truly understand, have awakened, and have generated the Bodhi mind, we will finally be free from delusions and attachments. The ninth principle of the three conditions is to deeply believe in the law of cause and effect. Earlier in my practice, I was puzzled by this phrase in the Visualization Sutra. Why? It seemed to imply that a bodhisattva had no understanding of the law of cause and effect. If we know that good causes will result in good effects and that bad causes will result in bad effects, how could it be that a bodhisattva would not be aware of this? But the sutra urges bodhisattvas to believe in cause and effect. I could not understand it. Then I read the Flower Adornment Sutra and upon carefully reading the chapter about the Ten Grounds, I suddenly saw the light. It said that from the beginning to the end, the Ten Ground Bodhisattvas have always practiced mindfulness of the Buddha. I then realized that the Bodhisattvas from the past, from the first to the tenth ground, and the level of equal enlightenment, all practiced the Buddha name chanting method. And I also came to understand that chanting the Buddha's name is the cause and attaining Buddhahood is the effect. Many bodhisattvas were not aware of this, which is why Buddha Shakyamuni explained it in this sutra. It was their firm belief in the above statement that led Manjusri Bodhisattva Universal Worthy Bodhisattva and Sudhana to vow to be born into the Western Pure Land. It was after I had studied and lectured on the Flower Adornment Sutra that I came to understand this statement. Thus, it really is very difficult to acquire this understanding. The tenth principle of the three conditions is reciting and upholding Mahayana Sutras, which help us to understand the true reality of life and the universe. With this proper understanding. We will know the proper way to think and behave as well as the appropriate method to use. Only when we truly accord with the teachings of the Sutra will we benefit. As practitioners, 
the least we need to do is to participate in the daily morning and evening ceremonies. The purpose of the morning session is to start a new day by reminding ourselves to base our thought and behavior on Buddha's teachings. The purpose of the evening session is to reflect on whether we have followed the instructions. If not, then we need to urgently regret and vow to correct our mistakes. For the sessions, Pure Land practitioners used to recite the Amitabha Sutra, chant the Rebirth Mantra three times, and then follow by chanting Amitabha. The more times they chanted Amitabha, the better the result. This practice of single-mindedness was the same for the morning and the evening. The Amitabha Sutra appears simple but is actually extremely profound. To recite and benefit, we need a pure, a quiet heart. The second time I lectured on the commentary of the Amitabha Sutra, it took over 300 sessions, which is an indication of the level of complexity. I now recommend the Infinite Life Sutra, which is easier to understand both in language and meaning. Since many people lead such busy lives, I suggest reciting Chapter 6 for the morning session, which is comprised of the 48 vows of Buddha Amitabha. It is the core of Pure Land Buddhism, because true cultivators need to have the same compassion and vows as those of Buddha Amitabha. For the evening session, I recommend reading chapters 32 through chapter 37, in which the Buddha teaches us how to end all wrongdoings, practice good conduct, and how to interact with objects matters, and people in our daily living. If we can follow at least these chapters, then we abide by the precepts. If we can follow the above practices, be mindful of Buddha Amitabha and abide by the teachings in these six chapters, we would have the same mind, vows, understanding, and practice of Buddha Amitabha. And then we are Buddha Amitabha. But if we chant or read indifferently without applying the principles, then all the efforts we put forth will be pointless. The combination of morning and evening sessions was designed in ancient times and proved to be useful. For the people of that time had better understanding of what they were reciting. These sessions reminded people to behave in a proper manner and thus helped them to detect their faults. Today, however, people simply recite absentmindedly 
like small children who sing a song with the right words to the right tune, but without understanding the meaning. Only when we become aware of the purpose and method of the chanting of the sutra can we actually achieve any result. My late teacher, Mr. Lee, always told his students that when they listened to the lectures, they needed to concentrate on understanding the principles in the sutra, not the words themselves. These principles are the laws governing the Buddhist teachings as well as worldly teachings. One who thoroughly understands the principles of one sutra can use them to master all sutras. In other words, the student must conscientiously follow the methods taught by the teacher and do so wholeheartedly without being distracted by anything new and different. To develop the parameter of patience, we need to persevere in our cultivation. People may recommend other methods or sutras as a better choice. Do not listen to them. Do not pay attention to them or until we have attained wisdom. Delve deeply into just one method. This is the key to success in our study and cultivation. The eleventh principle of the three conditions is encouraging others to advance on the path to enlightenment. To do this, we extensively introduce Buddhism to those who are willing to learn. While the first ten principles of the three conditions are for self-benefit and cultivation, the eleventh is to encourage and help others to understand and practice Buddhism. To help others is the act of a bodhisattva. By fulfilling all the principles of the three conditions, from practicing filial piety for parents to encouraging others on the path to enlightenment, we will become the good men and women of the Mahayana Sutras. The Earth Treasure Sutra tells us that if we chant the name, make offerings to Earth Treasure Bodhisattva, and accord with the teachings, then we can be born into the 33rd heaven 100 times without falling into the three bad realms. In our world, we are considered good men or good women after fulfilling the first condition. The criteria in the Theravada teachings requires us to meet the first and second conditions. However, in the Mahayana teachings, we are required to meet all three conditions. Therefore, 
when reading sutras, we need to ask ourselves whether or not we are qualified to be good men, good women. How much have I achieved? Does my conduct conform to the standards set forth in the Mahayana teachings? The three conditions are the basis for individual cultivation, whereas the six principles of harmony are the basis for group cultivation. The Sangha is a group of four or more people who practice the Buddha's teachings together, especially the six principles of harmony. They are sharing the same viewpoints or goals, abiding by the same precepts or rules, living and practicing together harmoniously, not quarreling, experiencing the inner peace and happiness from practicing together harmoniously, and sharing benefits harmoniously. Sharing the same viewpoints or goals means mutual understanding or agreement. A group needs to share the same viewpoints of the principles and methods for study and practice. This is the basis for harmonious group cultivation. If a society is to remain stable, its members need to live in harmony. Only harmony can draw us together in terms of opinions, ideas, and ways of life. In other words, being harmonious can minimize the difference in human relations and improve equality. After that, peace, and then finally, happiness can be achieved. To attain happiness, we must have a peaceful heart and body. Both Buddhist and worldly teachings emphasize the importance of harmony and respect. A few years ago, I went to Beijing and visited the Forbidden City, where there are three main palaces, the names of which all contain the word harmony. This shows that the early emperors of the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty, tried to rule the country with harmony. However, the disharmony which plagued the imperial family at the beginning of this century ended the dynasty. Therefore, harmony is crucial for lasting peace and happiness. Buddha Shakyamuni provided innumerable methods for practice but he did not intend that we try them all. We need to find the one that is most appropriate for us and then remember that the key lies in exclusive pursuit. In ancient times, the Pure Land School adopted three sutras and one Sastra. Now we emphasize five sutras and one Sastra, 
or commentary. As stated in an ancient Chinese textbook, of all the teaching principles, exclusive pursuit is the most important. Suppose, for example, some people like the Infinite Life Sutra, while others prefer the Amitabha Sutra. Can these two groups merge into one? They may merge, but they cannot practice together harmoniously. For when one half begins to recite the Infinite Life Sutra, the other half will begin to recite the Amitabha Sutra. In order to cultivate and create group unity, it will be necessary to set up two separate way places. This explains why there are so many different way places, even though we are all Pure Land practitioners. The same principle applies to choosing sutras with multiple commentaries. Which one will we use? This will result in a further setting up of way places. The same process can even occur when deciding which form of chanting to follow. Some prefer to chant slowly, Namo Amitabha, while others prefer a very fast, Amitabha, Amitabha, Amitabha. It would be very difficult for the two groups to practice harmoniously together. The people in ancient way places were able to achieve because everyone shared the same viewpoints and goals and practiced the same methods without intermingling. Their very atmosphere was conducive to magnificence and peace. Thus, though all those who entered naturally gave way to respect. Unfortunately, a common situation in modern way places is that the teachings of various schools are intermingled. Contradictions and conflicts are thus unavoidable, and it will be difficult for practitioners to focus, much less to succeed. So it becomes evident that sharing the same viewpoints or goals is crucial in a way place. If the people in a group share similar ideas and viewpoints, as well as the same interests and objectives, they can remain in harmony and thus form a Sangha. However, they may as well form a different Sangha if differences arise. Otherwise, there would be conflicts and no one would succeed. By providing an infinite number of methods for cultivation, the Buddha meant to ensure that people of different viewpoints and interests would be able to succeed in their cultivation. Thus, it is said that all paths lead to the same goal, as all methods are equal. This demonstrates the Buddha's great compassionate heart, as he never forces anyone to practice one 
particular method. Amitofo.